Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Karate Hall. The uh, Department of Economics is uh, delighted to sponsor this uh, round table on the new uh, microeconomics. Um, I'll just say by way of, I'll, I'll say a couple of words by way of introduction. It was uh, pretty clear to me already as a uh, sophomore in college that there was uh, something wrong with uh, microeconomics, a world of infinitely divisible pizza and beer, um, and that that was not a, uh, a model that was going to give me an enormous uh, leg up on understanding the world that I was in. So, um, so, was, uh, so, I'm, so I'm delighted to um, be a, uh, be, be a, 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 to play a small part in uh, the development of this project. Um, Sam Bowles, who has a much greater acquaintance with the uh, shortcomings of uh, microeconomics as it's currently conceived, has been um, running kind of a pincher's movement uh, with his graduate course, the, uh, the four C's, let's see if I can get all of them, the um, economics of conflict coordination, uh, cooperation, and communication. I think I got all, all the C's there. Um, at the graduate C's, level. But one of them was wrong. Oh, help know. me out. So <laughs> let me try again. Coordination, competition, conflict, and. The missing C. It sounded good when I was talking about it. Um, so that's at the graduate level, and then at the, uh, at the undergraduate level, there's already a, uh, the, I encourage everyone to have a look at the core econ um, uh, free uh, online textbook uh, developed with uh, Wendy Carlin and a, team, and a rather large uh, um, a team that's developing at the introductory level. But intermediate micro has remained uh, the... Um, has, 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 has remained the, uh, the, the, the real challenge. So, um, so the uh, folks from the Department of Economics here will tell you about a project that they've been developing uh, in, in this department, and we also have guests from the uh, Resource Economics, uh, which is undertaking innovative efforts to um, improve the instruction in intermediate micro. So let me uh, introduce, I, I will um, start, I guess, at, at your right and introduce our panelists. From the Department of Resource Economics, Professor Angela de Oliveira. And also from the Department of Resource Economics, Professor John Spragan, who will talk about their efforts to, um, to uh, reinvigorate uh, microeconomics in, uh, in their department. From the uh, Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts, uh, Professor Daniele Girardi, uh, PhD student uh, Sai Madurika. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge in the audience uh, PhD student Carmen Nadeau, who has been very heavily involved in this, uh, in this project. Uh, from uh, Smith College, Simon Halliday, and uh, back to Department of Economics at UMass Amherst, uh, Sam Bowles. Uh, missing from this duo who have actually written the textbook uh, that we'll be talking about today is uh, uh, Duncan Foley, Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research. So I don't think I have too much else to add since I'm not actually doing the work. I'm going to um, uh, pass off to the, um, to the panelists now. So um, we'll, we'll work down uh, the list. And actually, we're encouraging you to speak from your location. That's, uh, although feel free to walk. Well, let's see if the ambient noise is good enough. Um, uh, we're going to run through, I don't know, in exactly this order? Is that what we're going to uh, <laughs> Yes, we happen to be thinking the right way. Uh, the, um, uh, um, this is a, uh, actually this is a student of uh, um, Juan Camilo Cardenas from the ResEc department. Uh, and uh, she's graduating there from uh, uh, Universidad de los Andes. And um, uh, she has this wonderful statement she wrote on a blog uh, that um, uh, before she studied economics, she thought it would be great to learn how to predict human behavior using mathematical tools. The idea seems, it seemed fantastic to me, and it still seemed fantastic. But uh, all the, after all these, these years, uh, she had many tools, but the people who she wanted to study had disappeared. So she thought about it, and it, I mean, it's interesting. It wasn't that it was too mathematical. It was something else that was, uh, was wrong. Uh, so I, I wanted to talk about these two gaps, which is inspiring a lot of rethinking in economics, not just uh, in, in micro or in intermediate micro. The first is a remarkable uh, gap between what we teach our grad students and what we teach our undergrads, at least in the first year course and in many cases in the second year course as well. Uh, so I mean the, uh, uh, and, and the second is a huge gap between what the students came to economics to study, to learn about, be able to discuss and debate, and the topics that they're, they're having discussed in those courses. Uh, now, I don't mean to suggest that what we teach them in the courses is irrelevant, but a student going through the course might think it was irrelevant because they don't get much application to these things. Um, this, is an, this is a word cloud of, if you ask the 100 uh, Bank of England uh, uh, new recruits this year, what's the thing, what's the most important thing for economics to address? 
this is what they said. We just did a word cloud from this. Uh, interestingly, with the Brexit and so on. Uh, we've done this all over the world. I, I recently did the same thing at the uh, Central Bank of New Zealand and got exactly the same uh, thing. And you can see, this is what Juan Camilo did in, at the University uh, uh, de los Andes. Uh, this, is, uh, this is another one. This is UCL. No, this was, by the way, in the fall, before Trump was elected. <laughs> Donald Trump was, was one of the things that economics ought to be addressing. And you can go on. This is Humboldt University in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, I haven't done this in the US. Uh, but these are, I mean, all of these ones, these recent ones, are done before they've heard a word in the course. Uh, they just walk in, and the first thing they get is, please write on this piece of paper. Um, now, um, uh, so I think there is a, I mean, there's tremendous interest in economics. Uh, well, I was surprised that inequality was so large in these things. And there are a, a couple of places where you'll find other things almost as important. For example, in France, you'll see unemployment is very high on the list. Uh, but I mean, basically, everywhere where you do this, in inequality, climate change is important. Uh, the, um, uh, there is an ambition to this project as associated with this new course and this text. Uh, which I'd like to uh, now reveal to you, uh, and, and that's the following. Uh, when, when we face new problems uh, in economics, this often is uh, uh, the occasion for the evolution of a new paradigm. Uh, and so we have a new problem, massive unemployment during the Great Depression, and we have the Keynesian re revolution in economics, and this is then associated with a new textbook. For example, Samuelson 48 was famous and became really a great textbook because it integrated some elementary Keynesian ideas along with a standard uh, neoclassical ideas. Uh, I think you could say the same of Marshall 1890 and of Mill uh, half a century before. It seems interesting, it seems to happen about half a century. Uh, that there is this uh, uh, some new new set of ideas, new problems, and uh, new textbooks. These textbooks here lasted, you know, they, this was the dominant textbook. Actually, when, when I was studying economics at Harvard, uh, um, uh, we actually were reading Marshall as a textbook. Uh, it was a pretty good textbook, by the way, uh, and um, we didn't we didn't read Mill. Um, now. Um, uh, the, if, if, you, if you look at the current, uh, you know, the outstanding new te textbooks, uh, including Ajimoglu uh, et al., uh, it's extraordinary how little has changed in the content since Samuelson. They're much, much better pedagogically, and some of them have really, really good examples. Uh, but uh, the content is remarkably unchanged. Uh, now, th there are, if, here's a, a, an outstanding uh, intermediate text. Uh, uh, one of the things you notice is economics is defined primarily in terms of the market. It's about the market. It's about essentially buying and selling stuff. So that's important. I mean, this, this is what you start off with. So the, you know, the, the student is being given the idea that economics, I'm being a little unfair here, but the, the, the message is economics as uh, shopping. Uh, and there are a number of advances that uh, I think we can say economics has uh, achieved, uh, which tend to be uh, sidelined. This is an, ext I was trying to find disequilibrium in, in uh, Varian's book, which I couldn't find, but I decided to, to, uh, to look up equilibrium. And uh, it's, it's hardly mentioned, but here he says, well, we're not gonna deal with the problem of disequilibrium because uh, quite candidly, he was saying, we don't really understand it. Um, and I don't really think that's fair anymore to say that we don't understand disequilibrium. We have a lot of models which actually can be taught to undergraduates uh, about what happens uh, out of equilibrium. Uh, but the extraordinary thing, again, this is varying. Um, look where behavioral economics comes. Chapter 30. Does anybody ever get to chapter 30? Game theory in chapter 28. So they're not going to do any strategic thinking until ch chapter 28. Uh, and it goes on. I mean, Varian himself is, a, is a, a pioneer in asymmetric information, and that's the last chapter in the book. Uh, externalities in public goods, well, market failures clearly are important enough to be included in the book, but it's really beach reading for the summer uh, for the students. It's not going to be on the exam pretty clearly. Um, now, um, it, when I've talked with people about this, they say, oh, well, those topics are at the end of the book because either uh, they're more difficult, uh, and they really should be in advanced courses. Or you, you have to know the stuff at the front of the book in order to do the stuff at the back of the book. Uh, and you know, the more I thought about that, the more I didn't think it was true. 
some of the stuff that's at the back of Varian is incredibly easy to teach. Students love it, like uh, behavioral economics. They immediately understand things like uh, prisoner's dilemmas and uh, uh, ultimatum games. They get very engaged. And they learn a little bit of elementary game theory, Nash equilibrium, and some other basic concepts. It's not that it's too difficult. It's not because the prior study of theory was, was required. In fact, for some of those topics, you have to unlearn what was in the rest of the book in order to study carefully uh, the types of topics which were uh, then at the end of the book. I think, and uh, I'm only supposing this, that the reason why they're at the end of the book is because if you put them at the front of the book, you'd have to rewrite the rest of the book. That is, the whole book would be changed if you actually started off by saying, we're going to have a view of humans, which is we're complex psychological uh, individuals, we have limited cognitive capacities, we have both selfish and unselfish preferences, uh, we engage strategically with each other as the norm, price-taking behavior is uh, quite an exception. Price-making behavior is the standard thing which people do in at least many important markets, if not grocery markets, then at least labor markets and credit markets. Um, so there would probably have to be some new concepts. So suppose you surveyed students in our universities, and this was the list you came up with of stuff that they're interested in. I think it would be something like this. I mean, I've done it a lot. And those word clouds are an example. Here would be innovation. I think it would be a technical change innovation. Uh, and you know, something like this. Uh, suppose these are the things they're interested in. Now, I would say they're not wrong to be interested in these things. They should be interested in these things, because these are the things we want them to come out of the university being able to debate, reason about, access data about, come to some reasonable conclusion about. But if these are what they're really going to learn how to, how to, how to uh, discuss, well, then we're going to have to have some new topics. By the way, we're going to have to have a whole lot of the old topics. I mean, there's nothing here that says that things like opportunity cost, uh, substitutes and complements, and so on are irrelevant. Not at all. Those have to be uh, taught. Uh, but you can't teach about wealth creation and growth innovation without teaching about rents, Schumpeterian rents, and, of, of course, out of equilibrium behavior. If you, you can't teach about environmental problems without talking about non-market social interactions in the spirit of Schelling, for example, or Ostrom. Uh, again, if you want to talk about inequality, you, you, you have to talk a lot more about institutions in more detail than simply markets and private property, uh, uh, rents, bargaining power, and so on. Uh, if unemployment and fluctuations are important, then clearly incomplete contracts, credit and, le credit and labor markets would be part of the story that you'd hope that people learned about. If instability is important, you'd want the students to have learned the basic perspective from Hayek and others that prices are information. People uh, gather information from changes in prices, and sometimes that moves the economy in a direction which we think is the right direction, and sometimes it leads to large-scale divergences from the fundamentals. Uh, now, uh, the fact that the basic courses that we're teaching, uh, this is uh, either an intermediate, I think it applies also to the, to, to the in, in, intro levels as well. Uh, if this is the model, this is the old benchmark model. Uh, again, you, we can disagree about the details, but something like that, I think, is the old benchmark model. The first thing you notice is, if that's the benchmark model, it's OK that we don't care about sociology and psychology and political science and law. Because those things have actually been pretty successfully excluded once you assume these, uh, these assumptions here. It's a way of getting rid of the other disciplines. We don't have to care about their insights. Uh, but um, uh, if you now start modifying this with what I call contemporary microeconomics. Almost everybody in this room knows I'm an optimist, so I think that that's actually what's happening in microeconomics. If people have you know, motives in addition to self-interest, well, then social norms are important. Obviously, then sociology and psychology come into the picture. Uh, uh, of course, uh, price-taking behavior takes place, but price-making also does. Uh, if our information assumptions are uh, uh, that they are insufficient to enforce important kinds of contracts, that leads us to contracts being of a rather different sort, not, not classical contracts, but rather the kinds of contracts that lawyers study, uh, which actually makes the legal profession a highly profitable thing to engage in, namely that the contracts don't enforce themselves. Uh, this, of course, leads to a view of institutions which goes way beyond markets and includes, obviously, legal institutions and states. Um, 
The idea that rents, I mean, rents are discussed sometimes in economics texts at the intermediate level. They're always bad. There's something the government introduced. Uh, you know, for example, taxi licenses or import licenses. Uh, this new view of micro rents play an important role, not only Schumpeterian rents, but for example, the, the rents that employees have on their job, which is part of the motivation to work hard and well on the job, and the same in credit markets and so on. So rents are now privately generated as a part of the way a, a well-working capitalist economy works, and without which, without which it wouldn't work very well. Imagine that given all the incomplete contracts that we have, imagine that somehow God came down and said, you can't have rents. Well, if you couldn't have rents, then how would you motivate work, and so on. Uh, and finally, um, uh, these are some of the other things. You know, I, we, you know, if, if we care about uh, the, uh, the fairness and inequality, obviously we have to uh, try to develop in our students not a particular view of fairness. I don't think we could or should do that, but we should give them a language with which to discuss it. So they're at least familiar with such ideas as the veil of ignorance. Uh, where do the ideas come from? Well, you know, this, all this stuff is very new in economics, or so it's said. Uh, but um, so I just wrote down this list of when, you know, if, when I think about who are the people who we're constantly referring to in the book that Simon and Duncan and I wrote. Uh, there is Smith and Marx. Uh, Cournot plays a big role in the, in the book. I mean, part of the role is I, I want to convey to students that Cournot is, a, you know, not first and only mathematical economist, but he did a, a wonderful thing in conveying the power of math and economics. Uh, Marshall is frequently men mentioned. In fact, our math boxes are named after Marshall. Uh, Hayek, because of his view of the economy, which I see as being a, a great uh, advance, uh, the role of information in it. Coase, uh, Ostrom, uh, we, obviously we could, there, there would be others. Uh, uh, there, we could add others to the list, uh, but um, that's where these ideas come from. Sorry. So what I'm going to do here is basically to show you some examples from our book where we're trying to incorporate some of these insights that Sam was just mentioning into an intermediate text. Now, I'll also show you some of the pretty standard stuff which is in the book so far and which we kind of elucidate upon when we're trying to show our innovations. So you're gonna see both sides of that coin. Um, so to get a sense of that, we're, um, when we frame how people make decisions or how um, economic agents make decisions, our general framework is this idea that people have preferences, that individuals have beliefs, and that there are often constraints on the different actions that people can take. Um, in terms of some other topics, well, I'm gonna to be looking at exchange. Again, preferences are important. The idea that Sam brought up of rents um, occurring as a consequence of exchange, the mutual gains from trade that we talk about in economics, those are occurring. And then furthermore, we want to think about the ways in which institutions operate within um, exchange settings. Then the third one which I'm, which I'm going to talk about is this notion of coordination failures, how we look at that in the book a little bit, and then how we allow it to um, let us think about the different ways in which institutions can interact with coordination failures. So drawing on people like Arnold Ostrom, Ronald Coase, and others when we're thinking about the ways in which we see a coordination failure, and then how do we as economists and social scientists think about coordination failures um, in a variety of settings. So this is a graph with which um, many of us are familiar. Um, we have um, a, what we call in the book a feasible frontier um, with a feasible set, which you typically should have seen at some point in your introductory course with a set of indifference curves. So we have this in the book. Um, um, here, a choice for a student choosing between hours of leisure and a grade point average. So this is, this is a decision that the students in our courses obviously have to confront every single day. What is my GPA going to be and how much leisure am I going to enjoy? All right. Um, or another thing that you should have seen at some point or the kind of thing that gets taught in a standard course is we have a budget constraint and then we have their indifference curves and then we find the point at which we maximize whether to a tangent. Now the thing that we want to extend this to when thinking about the different kinds of preferences that people might have, or I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, is what happens when people in fact don't only value their own utility but value the utility of someone else. 
So we introduce a pretty basic model of altruism where we say that I, as Simon, I value my own utility and I am consuming one good, which let's say it's money, in order to think about an experimental setting. And that Sam, over here, he also values money and I care about Sam. Now what's going to happen then is that we're going to have two different people. We're going to have here an A and a B. Um, we talk about Aram and Bina in the book or um, Al and Bob and a variety of other different people with um, from different backgrounds. And we're going to think here, well, that same um, setting that you saw over here in your feasible frontier setting with your indifference curves, that same framework applies to a situation of um, altruism, to a situation which I have not just self-interested preferences, but social preferences. And that what we see here is we're going to once more have a feasible frontier, but in this case, we're going to have indifference curves which look slightly different to what we saw previously, where I'm valuing my own utility and your utility, but your utility isn't quite as valuable to me as my own utility, my own consumption. Okay? But we're going through the same process of finding a tangency. Um, higher curves are better. And I'm going to choose the point, the combination of your utility and my utility, in a setup where I've got slightly more than you. Basically, here I've got double the amount of utility that you do. But we're illustrating this choice in terms of, OK, I've got some money which I'm trying to distribute, and I'm going to have to make a decision of how to do this. Because we do refer to experimental economic results in this context. So what do we see in experiments? Now, given these experimental results, how do we explain it in some kind of basic economic theoretic way where we could teach this in a constrained optimization set? So that's one that we do. Something else I want to show you, and I obviously um, incorrectly ordered the slides, was what we also regularly try to do is empirically ground a bunch of things, um, where um, there's this great set of papers by Alan Kierman and his co-authors where they take actual um, uh, buying and selling data from a variety of fish markets. This one is from Somati in France. And what we want to show here is that, like, look, you can actually derive some kind of demand function from actual buying and selling choices. Um, and uh, for some of the students, you'll, you can explain that this is from a regression line. Um, and that, that's coming from some empirical data, but you, you, you can basically think about the way in which that's structured from data. Now, thinking about something else, what I want to think of here is, um, I said I'd also speak a little bit about exchange. Now, what you want to think of here is that this is basically a standard Edgeworth box that you would confront in um, a setting where you're talking about um, exchange in an intermediate microeconomics course. So what you want to think of there is that I have Person A's in indifference curves are increasing, they're getting high utility as we go to um, upwards. And then B's origin is up in the corner and they're getting high utility as theirs come down here. Now, what we also see is that we have an endowment point where they both start, and then they can engage in exchange. And if they engage in exchange, then they can move into a Pareto improving lens and eventually arrive at a point along a Pareto efficient curve, what we've also called the contract curve. Um, now, we've renamed a couple of things in the book because we found it hard to justify certain things to students. So, for example, we, uh, calling the thing which was describing those things that are Pareto efficient the contract curve, we couldn't come up with a good reason for that, so we changed its name to the Pareto efficient curve um, because that seemed to make more sense to us and it's made more sense to our students when we've introduced it to them. Now, knowing that, we said, okay, fine, we've got this thing. Um, and here we have two people who are homo economicus, who have self-interested preferences. Now we can also immediately talk about a world in which there are different sets of institutions that negotiate, um, sorry, that operate in terms of deciding who gets what in exchange. So the first thing we can think of is that obviously when you reinterpret this, you could say, what could happen when we have market operations? And that would get taught in the standard course. We have kind of Borésien tatonment, and we'd end up at the market, the market equilibrium. But another thing that we could think about is what happens when we have take it or leave it offers. So if I, as player A, have more power than you as player B, and I can make you an offer that you cannot refuse, um, or you basically end up at back at your endowment, then what that's going to tell me is that we could actually end up in a world at, here at point F, where I have more power than you, I'm going to determine the offer that I make you, you're going to end up in the same, basically the same indifference curve that you started off with at your endowment. A little more utility than that. Okay? But you're going to end up at point F. Now this immediately allows us to talk about inequality and distribution of rents. Who gets what and why? Um, we ended up at this place where I have more utility than you do as a consequence of my having more power than you do. Okay, so that's one thing in terms of the institutions that operate in terms of who gets what. Now the other thing that you want to think about too is I've introduced them to 
um, altruism or to social preferences in an earlier chapter, and then you might want to think to us, um, along with us, I should say, you might want to think, okay, well, can you get altruism or some kind of social preference in an Edgeworth box setting? So the question I want to ask any of you is, have any of you seen an, a model of social preferences in an Edgeworth box? Well, here's one. Okay. Um, so the first thing that you're going to notice is that um, social preferences, make your indifference curves in an Edgeworth box look pretty weird. Okay? They look like little ovals. Okay? So what you want to think of here is that we've got um, A's um, indifference curves are in green. Okay? They, like it where, they like outcomes where they have most, both more apples and more oranges. Um, B also has these blue indifference curves. And they also like outcomes where they have more apples and more oranges. But, but notice what gets closed off for us. What gets closed off is a situation in which I as player A or you as player B consume all of the apples and oranges. Okay, I actually prefer outcomes where you, I as A prefer outcomes where you as B get some of the apples and oranges. And you as B prefer for a world in which I as A get some of the apples and oranges. There is still going to be a Pareto efficient curve and there's still going to be some kind of conflict of interest around like, who's getting the amount of apples and oranges there. But the really interesting thing here is that we get a Pareto efficient curve, um, there's conflict of interest over it, and we're going to be able to discuss what happens when we have either low levels of altruism or high levels of altruism. So in this case, we have high levels of altruism. Unsurprisingly, in this alternative case, what's happened to the Pareto efficient curve? It's extended and we have lower levels of altruism. I care about you, but I don't care about you as much as I did in the other world. As a consequence, I'm quite happy for you to get a little bit less than I would if I'm player B, or similarly if I'm player A, okay, engaging in exchange. Um, so what we want to show you here is, you've still got similar ideas as you've seen previously in um, a kind of a world of self-interest and a Pareto improving lens and a Pareto efficient curve, but what we're seeing too is that you can think about things that we exclude and things that we include. Um, okay, so that's exchange. Oh, something else that I also want to illustrate quickly is one of the things that we will be doing um, throughout the project is we'll be um, provide. So this graph here, these are obviously the final graphs that a student will see. Um, but obviously, when you're teaching this kind of thing, just throwing this up there gets pretty intimidating. So what we'll also be doing is we have a variety of graphs where the graphs get slowly built up. So what you want to see here is I'm just going to show you a sequence of graphs. I'm, I'm not going to be able to explain every single step because we have, we're, we're time constrained. But what you want to see here is what's going to happen as we derive the different um, curves in a final graph. This is another set of institutions that you would have. Here, instead of the world in which I had take your leave it power over you in that situation, what happens instead is I can simply choose a set of prices to offer you as the first mover. Now, as a consequence, we end up at a Pareto inefficient outcome. Um, we'd illustrate that more in, in, in greater depth in the book, but the thing I want to show you here is kind of the step-by-step -step process that we go through in order to f basically uh, present the offer curve, which is also a best response function, and then get the point that would be choos chosen by the players in exchange. Now, the final thing I want to discuss briefly with you is so people sometimes get concerned about what's going to happen to marginal analysis, to marginal benefits, marginal costs. Um, so one, uh, whole, the, one of the chapters that we talk about is coordination failures and um, the institutional responses. So there we want to think about the example that we have is a basic common pool resource. So like a lake or an ocean where people are engaging in fishing or a forest where they could be extracting the wood or two people engaged in um, the use of a common ground. Um, now there are very many, uh, many, many different examples where this occurs, but what you want to think of is that I, as a, an agent in that world, I impose an external cost on someone else, there's, ne there's a negative externality, and someone else who's operating in that also imposes an external cost on me. This makes it immediately strategic interaction. Okay? Now what you want to think of then is, what is the basis by which we can think of marginal analysis here? And we can straight up think, okay, what's going to happen in terms of the marginal cost for an individual making a decision? And we've got for them an increasing marginal cost because your effort that you exert is providing you with disutility. So your, your disutility is increasing as you exert more effort. And then the other thing you want to think of is your marginal benefits as someone who is extracting from this common pool resource 
Um, those are going to be higher or lower depending on the amount of effort exerted by the other person. So what you see here are different situations where you've got higher or lower um, marginal benefits depending on what the other person does in terms of what an individual decision maker is, is doing. Now what then happens is when we once more find the final result of this, what we see is a model drawing on Cournot, drawing on Nash, drawing on um, basic work from Coase and others, where we have a Cournot style interaction. We have the players in difference curves, so green for A, blue for B. In the, so in the circumstance, um, A's um, utility is higher as these indifference curves move down, and B's utility is higher as the indifference curves move leftwards. Now what you want to think of here is we arrive at a Nash equilibrium. Now what you can immediately notice is that Nash equilibrium is not on the Pareto efficient curve. The Nash equilibrium, as we've seen from a prisoner's dilemma game, is Pareto inefficient. And then knowing this, what do we say? Well, this is our motivational, mathematical, and graphical example. But then we want to say, how do we intervene in this? And we argue that there are three main ways that we can do this. We can use markets, we can use states, and we can use communities. If I'm a member of a community with Daniele, Daniele and I, I might display altruism towards him, and he might display altruism towards me. Or we might have other social preferences where Daniele might punish me if I break a social norm. Now, the use of those is that they, in fact, take us away from the Nash equilibrium and bring us closer to the Pareto efficient curve. Okay? Another way to think about this is that if we have instead markets, what happens is markets allow one person with private property to own the lake. I own the lake. Daniele does not own the lake. I can then employ Daniele and tell him how much time, how much effort he should exert, or I should stipulate some quote about how much fish he's going to catch on the lake, and then we can move from there. Or, with states, a government could stipulate um, a tax that would tax us in terms of the amount of fish that we would catch and the amount of effort that we would exert. Okay? Now, all of that would then follow from this graphic and some discussion of the different ways in which those solutions would be implemented to take us to a Pareto efficient outcome. So, what do you want to think of here is that we return again and again to a variety of different themes. We have the preferences, beliefs, and constraints model that gets applied in an array of different situations. We think about diverse preferences. So it's not only self-interest, but it's also social preferences of altruism, inequality aversion, or concerns about social norms. We've got gains from trade or rents, as Sam was mentioning to us. There's also a conflict of interest over rents. So even when you have social preferences, the people engage in exchange still end up in conflicts over rents. Now what then happens is that the institutions that you have can either exacerbate that conflict over in, uh, that conflict of interest, or they can mitigate it, depending on the kinds of institutions that you have. And then with coordination failures, we want to think that external effects, positive and negative externalities, that they pervade many kinds of strategic interactions, many kinds of economic decisions that we as individuals have to make. And they're also the kinds of decisions that the students in our classrooms are making. For many of those students, they're not thinking that I take x as given, as a consequence I maximize subject to that x, and I have no effect on anyone else when I do so. They know that in their dorm rooms, it annoys them when their next door neighbor is playing music really loudly. Okay? And they're having to make a decision about what to study or trying to go to sleep when this other person has a negative externality on that. And this generalizes to a variety of other examples. Um, and then within that, we want to think, what are these institutional responses that we could have? Communities, markets, states are the ones that we highlight. But obviously, there are a diverse array of things that fall into those categories. OK, so I hope that's given you a nice taste of some of the things that we do. What I've just described here is basically the first kind of third to a half of what we're talking about in the book, obviously with a whole bunch of stuff left out. Um, but yeah, that's just a kind of quick taster menu. OK, thank you very much. I must first start by thanking the department for giving uh, all their support to this project and for, uh, to the team for uh, giving me this opportunity to teach it. Um, it's been uh, an incredibly enjoyable and like intellectually stimulating experience. And who doesn't want to be called a professor without totally deserving it? So, um, but so thank you so much. What I want to do is uh, focus on three aspects of the book that make it, in my view, a robust resource for the instructor and very good learning material for the student. So the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, was about the relatability and relevance of the book to the students. So um, 
we talk about, for instance, how slow Wi-Fi on campus is essentially just a prisoner's dilemma problem, or how they can expect their team members to put in effort or not on, or, on a team project, right? Or how, what explains the relationship that they have with their managers at work. So the book is about their lives. So for instance, this is an email that I'd received from uh, a student somewhere towards the end of the course, and he was sharing a comedy clip with me and telling me how um, watching that clip actually helped him answer questions on wages and effort levels in class. Uh, he also apologized for the crude language. Um, so repeatedly I felt like the, the book was about them. And that, I think, is in stark contrast to most traditional microeconomics courses where there is a model and the instructor is expected to find an example that fits that model. So uh, this, was, this was very refreshing, getting video clips from students or uh, you know, having them discuss their experiences with respect to some of the models that we were studying. The second reason why it's relatable and relevant is that it's based on actual economic behavior. So uh, about in the third or the fourth class uh, of the semester, we played the dictator and ultimatum games. And they realized that, uh, first I must apologize for how shoddy the results look to all the experimental economists in the room, but uh, they got the point. The point was that uh, they, gave, they chose to give away on an average a couple of dollars out of the $10 that they had, and it changed uh, in the ultimatum variant of the game. So, and then, as uh, uh, Simon pointed out, we go on to talk about how uh, social preferences are not inconsistent with rational behavior uh, and, and about altruistic preferences and how they can be incorporated into goal oriented behavior. So uh, again, they felt like the book and the content was directly about them because they were seeing it in action during uh, the duration of the course. And this made them a both like engaged, so they felt more engaged with the content, and they were scientifically more curious. They wanted to know what was coming up next, and that was very refreshing and satisfying. Aspect of the book that I thought was very interesting was that it was both challenging and rewarding. So uh, when when the students come into Econ 203, they've just been introduced to basic elementary economic concepts, and they are just about familiar with the language of uh, math and graph. So they just about know it, but they have not been able to use these skills to actually ask interesting economic questions and try and answer them. And that's what this course, I think, allows them to do. It allows them to polish those skills and use them to, like, to become actual economists. So, and a large part of the course, therefore, involves the hard task of becoming rigorous analytical thinkers. But what was surprising was that there were very few complaints. They didn't seem to feel unhappy, or maybe they just didn't show it to me, but there, there, wasn't, there wasn't enough, uh, I didn't see uh, enough, I, I didn't see as much unhappiness about the rigor of the course as I expected to. And I think that goes back to A, the structure of the content, and B, again, its relevance. So let me give you uh, an example. So Simon showed this graph uh, in his presentation. It's basically the first time that they come across the idea of uh, utility maximization with respect to uh, someone else's best response function or with someone else's incentive compatibility constraint. And the idea that the outcome that results is Pareto inefficient is actually quite a hard one to grasp. It's, it's pretty complex to teach it, and they take some time to understand it. But this is in chapter five. And between chapter five and much later, they, they get to see multiple iterations of this idea of utility maximization respect, with respect to someone else's best response function. And eventually, they master it. And by the time we come, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, by the time we come to talking about labor markets and incomplete job contracts, they have absolutely no difficulty understanding how the Nash equilibrium in an incomplete job contract is Pareto inefficient. So this is, I understand this is too much detail, but to me this is a 
classic example of how early on in the semester, they have to deal with some hard concepts that they have to master. But with eventual iteration and practice, they're able to say very powerful things about the labor markets, about how uh, an H&M manager here in the United States has control over a textile worker in Bangladesh, about credit markets. They're able to say very powerful things. So they come out of the semester feeling extremely empowered, even though they had a difficult semester. And that as an instructor is very satisfying. And finally, uh, I think the course makes for excellent support for anyone that wants to be an economist in the future. So uh, I think the, and that's for two reasons. So first of all, I think it's a great introduction to thinking like an economist. So throughout the duration of the semester, we start by observing a historical concept. We start by observing a historical phenomenon or actual real world phenomenon. We then go ahead and build a simple, clear model. And then we come out with insights about the historical phenomenon we started out investigating. And, that, and, the, and we do that repeatedly during the course of the semester. And that, to me, is a great introduction to how economists or how one can think effectively as an economist. And second, I think the, if they, even midway through the semester, the kind of concepts that we talk about allow them to understand the basic ideas or the basic arguments being made in most of the recent literature that's coming out in behavioral microeconomics. They don't even have to be very far into the semester to be able to do that. They can do it even midway through the semester. So a student that's actually trying to make up her mind about whether she wants to become an economist or not has enough to work with in terms of making that decision. And if she does, she has a great introduction to the content and we would have given her good support in order to be able to do this. So I think that's, as, as an instructor, those have been the three big uh, things that have helped me go through the semester and my students, A, its relatability and its relevance, B, how challenging and yet rewarding it was, and finally, how it was good support to an undergraduate that wants to become a uh, So first of all, I also would like to thank Michael and the department for giving me the opportunity to participate to this project as a teacher. It has been a, really a great teaching experience. I also noticed that there was a very, overall, very positive reaction from students uh, on this. And so the things that Sai uh, said, they, I agree with them. Uh, I saw them also in my course. Uh, students it's easy for them to relate with the materials because they see that everything is clearly aimed at understanding something about the real world, the world they live in. So it's easy for them to make connections with their everyday lives and the society they live in. Uh, so, I, so definitely these things apply also to my course. I, so I will not repeat them, but I definitely agree. I would like to add something uh, on the relation between what we teach in microeconomics and what we teach in macroeconomics uh, to undergraduates. I teach also intermediate macroeconomics, so uh, I have uh, somehow a privileged point of view on this. And so if you consider what we teach today in intermediate macro, if you take the la latest edition of the Blanchard textbook, which is what everyone uses in intermediate macro, you see that also macro, the teaching, also the teaching of macro is changing. So if you take the latest edition of the Blanchard book, you have a new Keynesian model that is not based, doesn't find its micro foundations in variation general equilibrium, but in incomplete markets, imperfect competition, and coordination problems. Uh, so in this model, basically, you have three main building blocks. You have a wage curve, that is basically the idea that the real wage is a decreasing function of the unemployment rate. Then you have a price setting curve that is basically the idea that firms set prices as a markup over costs, and this markup is a function of market power. And then the third building block of the model we teach uh, in intermediate macro is the Keynesian consumption function, the idea that uh, people's consumption reacts to changes in current income. Uh, 
So what are the micro foundations of these three big pillars of the model we teach to students in macro? Uh, in the chapter in the model, labor market model that we provide to students uh, in this new course, we derive exactly the wage curve that is the first building block that I mentioned of the Blanchard model. The treatment of competition in this book by Sam and Simon uh, puts it like in the central place the Cournot model that produces exactly the price setting curve that is the second pillar of the model that we now teach in macroeconomics. The chapter on the credit market provides a model of the credit market that as a result it produces the fact that people are credit constrained and so uh, their consumption will react to changes in income. So I think the bottom line of all this is that there is a strong case to be made that a change in the way we teach microeconomics along the line that Sam has described is necessary also to have more consistency between what we teach uh, to students in micro and in macroeconomics. So today, what we, where we are going in terms of teaching intermediate macro is models that have their micro foundations in uh, imperfect competition, incomplete markets, coordination problems. That is exactly the things that this new course uh, takes from the bottom part of the book and puts them in the first chapters. So, uh, yeah, so basically the point I want to make is that uh, we need to go in this direction also uh, because there is a very nice complementarity between where we are going in terms of this new intermediate micro course and where the teaching of macroeconomics is going. So I'm John Spragan. I'm from the Resource Economics Department. I've been teaching intermediate microeconomics now for 17 plus years, and, and basically I've, well, I've used the kind of standard textbook that everyone uses. And, and for me, the idea seems to be to introduce the, the underlying principles of demand and supply. And, and, and it's always a struggle for me to, to fight them through this before I finally get to the end of the course and I can start to to teach things that are starting to become more interesting. Um, and, and so I've had a little bit, I've had the opportunity to have a little bit of a, a look at uh, Simon and Sam and, and Duncan's book. And, and I think they're, they've done a, a good job of, of cutting to the chase, to getting away from a lot of the, the introductory stuff and getting to the meat of the issue. And so I've been pretty impressed, impressed with it. So thank you guys for that. Um, and, and I guess the other thing that I'll, I'm not gonna talk for too long here. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, is for me as a student, um, that the important part of my microeconomics class was what the instructor could get excited about. And I had the, t the opportunity to have two intermediate microeconomics classes. I had one that was m the more standard supply, demand, and, and market structure course. And I, I really enjoyed that basic course where they were just presenting these very simple models, models to it. And, and then I had another class that was on efficiency and equity. And these are more the things that you guys are trying, and you're trying to integrate these two things together. Um, and, and I think that's great, but I also think that it's, that to the extent that you're providing a structure that instructors can get excited about is, is a really good thing. Okay, thanks. So, like John, I'm an experimental economist and a behavioral economist, and so the, the types of things that are, are being discussed in, in this text are certainly um, the bread and butter of the type of work that we do in terms of our research and thinking about how people are making decisions and, and what's impacting their choices and, 
Uh, if they're making choices in a risky world where those risks impact other people, when, when do they care and when don't they? Um, when do the standard assumptions work well and when do the standard assumptions fail? And so those are certainly some of the, the questions that, um, that many of us in this room find to be you know, very interesting and exciting and the things that we care about. And when you talk about those sorts of, of questions and projects with the students, uh, it's the things that get them excited. Um, and so how uh, these sorts of things have historically gotten integrated into courses by the professors who care to integrate them is by you know, talking a little bit about their research or bringing in experiments as examples in some of the, the teaching portions or having students read uh, papers about, okay, we've learned about how it works well, let's look at what happens when it doesn't. And so it requires a lot of additional effort on the, on the part of the professor to keep the students engaged and to bring in some of the newer insights that are not necessarily addressed uh, in, in, in the current texts. And so it certainly is very exciting to think about um, presenting both uh, the rigor and, and the, the ability to analyze critically that we value so much in teaching of intermediate microeconomics um, with some of, some of the interesting questions and the things that, that students are gonna get very engaged in. Donald and I have been talking about microeconomics for more years than either of us can remember, decades. Uh, and it's, I've always learned a lot. And I know that uh, you teach a course different from the, the, this course that's laid out. And you've taught it for a great many years very successfully. So I'm sure, I mean, sure you have you know, some sense of this. I don't, obviously, I don't expect it to be favorable. <laughs> we have, we've had many conversations before, but I, you know, you're, you're, you're Mr. Intermediate Micro around here, and uh, this is sort of, may seem faddish or uh, overly ambitious or whatever. I want to hear what you think about it. Well, um, first of all, I think it's very interesting. Uh, I, uh, I like the kinds of ideas that you're using and what you're doing. Uh, it's just that when I think of microeconomics, I think of it very differently from the way you think of it. Uh, the, the, um, what I gather that the way you're approaching the subject is that there are a variety of different topics and questions and problems that you want to try to solve. And I think that's very, very good and very interesting. But I, I, as I say, I look at it very differently. I, I look at microeconomic theory as a way of understanding how the microeconomic world operates. And that's a, that's a very different perspective, I think. I guess that comes from my uh, general delivery background. Uh, and I'm looking at the, uh, the overall uh, aspects of the way things operate and, and how we gain understanding, what, what the methodological issues are, uh, how, how this, uh, all of this relates more generally than, than you're talking about to, to the real world. Uh, and I, I, I don't see any, uh, I have no objection to what you're doing in any way. I think it's very interesting. I think it, uh, it, it's quite complementary to what I do. Uh, a lot of the topics uh, that, that and some of the topics that I've heard today I, I, I think are very important. Uh, and uh, I, I, have, I do talk about some of them in the intermediate courses, uh, like externalities and public goods and things of that sort. Uh, I don't get into much of uh, game theory, I don't get into much of the uh, uncertainty literature. But that's, I think that's only because I don't have time. Uh, were I to have a, a second semester of uh, intermediate micro, I think that would go in this direction. I think it's, I think it's very useful. So the floor is the same we were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'd like, let me say one more thing. Uh, Donald and I don't agree. I mean, we're, one thing we've agreed on is that we enjoy talking to each other about this. And the other thing which may strike you as odd is that 
I, I think I'm speaking for you, Donald, that one of the most interesting ideas that's ever been proposed in any of the sciences, I think, is the idea of a general equilibrium of a competitive system. And, you know, I, I sometimes have said, ask yourself, what do economists know that a well-trained sociologist who studied some economics or political scientist don't know? I think the answer is uh, general competitive equilibrium. I mean, it's seen broadly. That is, how things which are happening here can affect other things here. Um, and uh, so I, I think one of the things I think is unfortunate is that the study of how a whole economy, a many market economy works, has fallen into essentially ill attention, not typically taught, uh, or not taught much. And that certainly is not true of Donald's course, either graduate or undergraduate. Uh, and I think that he's right in focusing on that as being a really fantastically important idea. Where we disagree is about the adequacy of the models we now have for that. But that's been a friendly and, and fruitful disagreement over, what, 30 years, so? 40. 40. <laughs> <laughs> chapters that are relevant to that. The, <clears throat> the, the one is fairly standard, it's called Competitive Equilibrium or Perfect Competition and Invisible Hand. Uh, it's, uh, it's finished uh, but not actually circulated. Uh, and it, it, it talks about, it's, it's a fairly standard, it starts off fairly standardly uh, and uh, it uses the Edgeworth box to teach uh, general competitive equilibrium and its properties. It teaches the first and second uh, welfare theorems uh, fairly, uh, fairly clearly, I think. Uh, it then moves on to say um, uh, what's uh, something like what's wrong with the fundamental theorem, and there's really two points. One is it may not be applicable to most real economies because of the uh, the fact that the uh, complete markets or complete contracts assumption is typically violated. And secondly, there are problems about the out of equilibrium behavior by which you get from an endowment point to the uh, Valraisian equilibrium, problems that have yet to be solved except for under what I think are special conditions and Donald doesn't object too much to. Well, I, I you, you, the, the, so uh, the fact that goods are gross substitutes will do it. There are a few other ways you can do it. The auctioneer clearly isn't a description of a market economy. It's a highly centralized fiction. Uh, and that's a problem in, the, in that theory. Uh, we then go on to say that, I mean, it's, this may surprise you, we then go on to show that you don't need the auctioneer to get efficiency. As long as you have efficient, cozy, and bargaining, uh, you'll get to the contract curve or the efficient contract locus through just through a process of everybody you know, bargaining with each other. This is something which Foley pioneered, actually Stephen Smale had a similar idea before Foley. Uh, we, teach, uh, we teach cozy and bargaining, and then we end up with um, uh, a very non-technical treatment of the Myers and Satterthwaite theorem about uh, the, how the impossibility of efficient exchange, even with well-defined commodities, uh, because of the impossibility of eliciting true statements about the valuation of goods. This sounds much more technical than it is. Um, and then we, we, and we both start and end up, we start with uh, Nixon and Khrushchev in the kitchen in Moscow debating about living standards. Uh, and, uh, what, and actually what, the things I said are pretty interesting. Uh, I, I have the whole, the CIA has the whole thing, you can get it online. And then we come back to that at the end and we talk about the, the way that the general equilibrium model informed that debate and why that, uh, according to us, was a mistake and that Hayek actually had it right in 45 when he said really the problem with planning is information. Uh, and um, then uh, we close by saying, let's not compare ideal systems, let's see what we can do in the second best world. So that's that. There's an earlier chapter, which uh, Simon mentioned, in which we, we introduce the Edgeworth box. We have these two people kind of discovering this, there's no production, and they discover a bunch of stuff, and then they discuss all the different ways they might allocate it. Um, and uh, everything from a benevolent planner to an auctioneer, to take it or leave it offers, that, is, that, that allows us to look at all the different ways they could interact in that Edgeworth box. 
Uh, some of those things might be called general equilibrium and some would clearly be called something else. So those are the two main places where, the, uh, where this appears. Uh, and we, we, uh, um, but obviously, devoting just a part of the course to that, you can't, uh, I mean, I think we're very appreciative of the importance of the idea. We don't know how effectively we teach it because that part hasn't been taught yet. Uh, so, I mean, if, if Donald would say, maybe two chapters is not enough, I'd have to say, I don't know, maybe you're right. I would never say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't you call on people? Oh, Carmen? So. I obviously have a bit more of a background to the book, but maybe you can talk a bit about what you think about the fact that the book teaches you know, the conceptual understanding of economics in a very intuitive kind of way. There's lots of graphs and things where students can understand it. But traditionally, micro has been taught in a very technical way where mathematical tools and methodology uh, have been, you know, really been something fun. So, you know, when you see engineers who don't have economic intuition will do very well in economics because of those like methodological reasons. And how do you balance the two, basically? Um. Okay, well, so I have a bunch of different answers to your question. One is that um, the other thing that we've realized while teaching the course is that, um, so the thing that you have to think about two years in terms of the market for intermediate microeconomics, approximately two thirds of that market do not use calculus in the teaching of intermediate micro. So um, we do use calculus in the book, so at the moment that means that we're fitting into that one third of the market that uses calculus. Um, which, and as a consequence of that, we're kind of also navigating both this intuition aspect that you speak about, but also some of the technical stuff. So it's been pretty interesting for me because I've taught a course with the with initially notes and then first draft and then most recent draft of where we are with um, this book um, at Smith College. And as I've gone through those iterations, I've seen um, the ways in which my favoring different aspects of this has favored or disfavored different kinds of students. And so I would have a student who's come in with, for example, three semesters of calculus, like the first time I was teaching, say, Cournot, and sh she just knew it excellently. She was right there and she was totally happy. Um, but then I had this, the same student when I was showing and showing them and trying to understand why in a coordination problem like the, the one that I showed there, why we have these um, strange directions in terms of the disutility that you intuitively experience from exerting a lot of effort, plus the effect that someone else has on you. Like they could, that student could show this stuff mathematically, but then there was this kind of, I, I, you see these lovely moments where students have these eureka moments like, oh wait, I've been in this situation where I don't want to exert any more effort, but I'm better off when someone else exerts less effort. Um, and they do grasp that intuition from a graphical way, in a way that they didn't get just from the math. Like the math for them, is, it was often divorced. It was just this thing that they could do in, in an engineering and kind of step-by-step -step rote manner. But then having to think through it, and also the other thing that I do is I get my, I'm doing a very Smith, like liberal arts college way of doing this sometimes, where I get them to reflect upon this stuff and have discussions with each other about the kinds of problems that they feel this applies to. Um, and so, in doing that, they have to think more generally about what the applicability of this is. Um, and we do, within the book and whether, within our like, wider discussion of how to teach the book, we do try to situate this in the, like, the modern learning sciences. Like, what do you need to do in order to get a student to think more intuitively about a concept and not just do it in a rote manner? Um, how do you interleave different topics? How do you revisit them again? Um, and we're trying to do that throughout the book in order to improve the student's intuition and always to get them to think, um, not only is this mathematical stuff like, pretty relevant, but how do I then interpret that in an economic way that makes sense given the theory? So, yeah, we're, we're making our best attempt at that. Um, do, you, do you want to add anything more to that? Or? No, but uh, do you use calculus in the, in the ResEC intermediate? We do, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and use it, in, I mean, we try to have it both ways. We stick a lot of it in boxes and so on. Uh, there's not a lot in the text, but students still, students who are math -phobic don't like it. Uh, yeah, we battle with this. And so we use a textbook that has the math integrated, mm -hmm. and we integrate the text into our lectures. 
and we've added a lab where we focus directly on the math mm -hmm. and, and just making sure that they've got those math skills um, yes, ready to go. Yes, sir. So I do the same. Like, so basically my first discussion section is like a quick like revision of powers and logs and yeah. differentiation. Mm -hmm. And then I have an online quiz where they do this. They do a little bit of that stuff just to, as a refresher. Because it, what you do end up with is you have quite a bit of inequality amongst, among the students mm -hmm. in terms of like a student who's taken Calc 1 and she might have done it in high school and someone else who just that semester has completed, the previous semester has completed Calc 3. So um, that's just something that, that I as the instructor have to navigate and understand that it's other, something that other instructors have to navigate too. Um, but yeah. Our, our distribution is a little bit different. We have, <laughs> yeah, we have people who don't have any calc effectively, uh -huh. effectively, right? Mm -hmm. And so, our we do the introduction to powers and logs and, and the graphing lines, and we spend a, at least a couple of weeks doing differentiation because even if they've had it in a course and and but they don't have it in their heads, right? Yeah. Or the intuition yeah. of it. Mm. Yeah. Or the intuition. Yeah. Yeah. I come at this in different directions. I mean, I have a couple of the class that requires micro, where I start off by talking about markets the way you heard about them in micro versus markets as a fiction uh, or metaphor, as some feminists say. So I like this idea of thinking about markets as one way to represent an exchange among uh, real people. I completely agree with the idea that it's more engaging for students to look at some of the problems that you looked at early, like taking from the back of the book, but in front, and it reduces some of my problems when I do teach one of the introductory and intermediate, where I did a lot of work trying to bring that into the topics early on to engage students uh, and show that it wasn't all abstraction and math, but did have relevance to their lives very early in the course, right? I applaud you for those. Um, but I, I have problems in the same, at the same time thinking about how to use time. How do I prepare introductory students for this kind of intermediate mm -hmm. class? Mm -hmm. If my introductory students are prepared, then I won't need two semesters to get what I want to get out of your introductory material because I, I don't feel the existing introductory courses prepare them well enough for an intermediate course that I would, where I would want to use this uh, book to its best use. Moreover, there, and your book may create new things that I have to spend a lot of extra time on, independent of that, that given that first problem. Uh, I only had a chance to look at a few chapters, maybe about halfway through the book. But I felt, uh, even in one of the slides here, that there are topics and specific examples that would need a lot of supplementation, a complementary work on my part to keep everyone on the same page and not lose some people to dissonance and maybe even alienation. A simple example we all saw was the one where they're choosing across 16 hours how to allocate time to leisure and to studying when many of my students have to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just lost those students uh, when they look at that. Uh, and two examples I've raised, one is price discrimination in labor markets, one is an, I think it's a coordination problem, I can't remember, in housing inequality. And while I think it's great that there's race in there, because I've studied lots of micro they don't have race anywhere. Uh, it's going to lose some students who have a uh, fuller, more rich vision of what, of how the labor market and housing market discrimination really work. Maybe just distraction, maybe just be dissonance, but it could be alienation, and it shouldn't be interpreted as ignorance or lack of intelligence. So when I teach my group, I teach everything. I'm looking at the emotional response of students to everything they read and everything I say, and how can I best use that to keep them all together and moving forward. Great. I think it's a real tension. 
because, uh, for example, we teach the segregation model, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to use their high motivation to study that to teach them that modeling is pretty cool, and maybe they should believe in models. But what you're, you're saying is somebody who's thought a lot about that and maybe has strong feelings about it says, what? Uh, this model is nothing about my experiences in the, in the segregated housing market, and they could actually feel offended because I'm not here. But see, I jump on that, and I build on that mm. with extra readings or, 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 yeah. or acknowledge that uh, dissonance for some of those students. How might you add to this information problem related to the fact that here's a reading, um, realtors in New York a couple of years ago in a survey admitted to not showing the same uh, apartments to white folks yeah. as to see apartments and buildings that were integrated, or uh, apartments to black folks who asked to see apartments and buildings that were largely white. How do you use that information to keep them focused while acknowledging the real world and the housing market? More work. It's a lot more work. Yeah, but in that's, I mean, there. That is, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah, it works if they have a teacher like you. And the problem with the textbook is you don't know who you're going to get, you know, and so it, well, it, we, we have to have, I mean, I don't think we succeed I, in I would say what doesn't work is having white students think is just an information problem, just a coordination problem, and never getting to learn about that. Yeah, right yeah. So it's more important than that, not just finding the right teacher. It's at least acknowledging in the textbook. Here's some more to read, yeah. or another way to think about this, even in a footnote. One of our PhDs. Acknowledge what's missing, or you're going to lose your students, not just from your book, and, but from the discipline. Yeah, no, I guess right, and there are a lot of, those are a lot of good ideas. Justine Burns, who you may remember was a PhD student here years ago, she's teaching the course at University of Cape Town to what, 400, uh, yeah, about 400, students. 400 uh, intermediate students, where undoubtedly those questions must come up right to the fore. We should ask her, but I'm going to convey to her what you Yeah, so, uh, so just a little bit on that, on that. So I was just in Cape Town, I gave a guest lecture in the course, um, and they also have this motivate. they have to write an essay at the end of the course, and they're going to be writing an essay about land reform. Um, they pick up, and so one of the things that they're going to ask the students to do is like, so use the models from the book to um, talk about land reform and these different policies that um, could be a, that have recently been proposed. For example, the president was recently saying that he wanted to talk about expropriation of land. And so, um, like, what are the different incentives about that? What is, how does that fit within the framework of this? And what are the alternatives? Um, and so, they, and they do also, they've got some additional readings that they're doing. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's done in a variety of different ways. In terms of what you were just also talking about there, one of the things that I spoke about with my students when so just so that everyone knows, we do this model of segregation in the chapter where we teach competitive markets in order to show that competitive markets can result in um, both efficient and um, kind of parade efficient outcomes, but also there are, um, there are situations in which it results in um, inefficient and um, kind of objectionable outcomes in terms of something like segregation. Um, and so I had this really great and fruitful discussion with my students about this recent evidence from Airbnb um, on um, how different Airbnb hosts are prejudicial to people with African American names when they're trying to get um, a place to stay. And so the students were, um, it also catalyzed an interesting discussion of, okay, so I can't capture every aspect of that in this model, but what you also want to think of is that economics offers a set of tools that allows us to start thinking about this in an interesting way and this is one of the first steps that we can take in order to do that. Um, because we're not able to deal with every single nuanced model to confront every single problem in one intermediate microbook. Um, but it does open the doors for us to do that in a variety of new and interesting ways. Um, and so I've gotten more students, because I've had activist students who are in there and they're thinking, oh, okay, economics actually isn't as, yeah, because you want the students who are in there because their parents told them they have to get a major in econ, <laughs> and they're doing it because they have to complete it, and they may, many of them think, um, excuse my language, they think economics is bullshit. And then you're, get, you're showing them the stuff that's, wait, it's actually grounded in empirical evidence and um, a bunch of stuff that I can actually relate to. So in my experience so far, it's been valuable in terms of addressing those kinds of questions. Yeah? Uh, well, I'm intrigued because a, I don't teach my 
John Angela do to that. <laughs> but I'm intrigued because it seems that the text would promote more critical thinking skills among students, and that should be one of our, our primary objectives here at the university. Um, but Simon, you've been teaching this for, for years. Do you have any feeling or sense about how students do move beyond you can move in micro to other courses, maybe apply micro courses or advanced courses? So, um, Great question. I love. I wish I had an experiment. Um, yeah. So it's it's been yeah it's been three years that I've been teaching at Smith, and so th there's a bunch of stuff that also is going to enter into us, which which, which creates noise. The fact is, so this is, when I taught this, I was shifting into a liberal arts college from having taught in massive classrooms, um, and obviously we're, we're writing the text, and th there is some noise there in terms of my ability to teach it as someone who's um, at the same time contributing to it. So I'm going to have some. Um, kind of inside info that other people wouldn't have if they were instructing with the same book. At the same time, my interpretation so far, um, so I teach obviously both intermediate micro and a couple of other courses, so I teach an economic development elective, I teach a seminar on African development, and I teach an upper level elective on behavioral economics. Um, I had a massive selection effect into my behavioral economics upper level elective, where students were really demanding that it exist in the first place, and I had students who did well or really loved the intermediate micro course with me who wanted to be in that course. Um, and they d then, they just really, would, they had an empirical project that they had to do and they would run with the ideas. So in terms of my engagement with that, I think it's been very successful. They, it really lights a fire under them in terms of like trying to think about the different ways in which economics operates. Then also when I engage them again in either economic development, the elective, or intermediate micro, uh, sorry, inter my, my seminar, then I've also seen the students, there's a difference in the students who have taken that uh, thinking, oh, but wait, like this kind of thing that we're addressing in terms of thinking about this um, randomized control trial in um, Kenya, it's a consequence of incomplete contracts and an issue with, to do with insurance. And as if a student had not seen that in their intermediate micro class, which many students do not see, then they wouldn't have gotten how pervasive those problems are. And so, they can then read the paper in a more nuanced and critical way um, when they're doing that in their seminar and writing this capstone um, uh, research paper. So um, I'm biased. I'm, I'm going to be suffering from confirmation bias all over the place when I'm doing this. And um, obviously, I'm really invested. But it has felt like a really good experience for me seeing those connections that the students are able to make as a consequence of having taken that course with me. And I feel like I see qualitative difference in the students. And maybe you have an idea about this. I mean, one of the things we really ought to do is we should do some either experiments or surveys. Uh, you know, maybe a two by two before, after, and also a standard course and non-standard course uh, to pick up some of these things. And it'd be interesting to see, obviously we'd be interested in the cognitive learning, that is what we're actually able to do at the end of the course, but also something about career objectives, uh, attitudes. When you think about engaging in sort of uh, critical thinking, as people who study evaluation, now that's one of the hardest things there is to actually uh, test. But it's obviously something that we're all trying to do. And uh, I mean, certainly that's one of the things that we think we're doing. Uh, we make a lot of emphasis on problems that they're, they're engaged with and then say, okay, don't tell me, well, I think this and well, I think that. Use the model to tell, to, or use the model or some data uh, to give an answer. It sounds like it's a good way to teach that, but I mean, well, we, in, in kind of methods, I mean, that's one of the things that we often suffer from. There are two reasons why signs look weird. So, you know, you get a parent wrong sign, and you want to model why, and it tends to get a better sense of the people being critical about the model and the theory that underlies the model. But have you thought about how to do that in econometrics? Um, <laughs> well, it's hard. it's really hard. I mean, I, I started you know I started thinking a lot and reading a lot of the literature, and it's you know not so easy. Um, Coming at it from uh, undergraduate programming side, I tried uh, this is what the second semester which we're teaching the summer of two hundred three, and the response I'm getting from students, granted only a couple of students, is that so far this is the most difficult course they've taken in the university, um, which generally 203, the intermediate micro is considered among our undergraduate students, the full course. But it's been the best course they've taken so far with, with Psy. 
One, one of the things that, one of the questions they have though is both of these students who comment to me have taken the, 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 calcul the level of calculus here at the university that's for math majors, art science, econ students who want to go to graduate school in economics, namely math 131 and 132, and they really wonder how anyone who's taken the math for social scientists, the, the calculus for social scientists, which is math 127, which is taught in a very large lecture, multiple choice exams, things like that, how they could possibly handle the course. You know, and, it's, and, and I'm not saying it should be uh, slowed down for those students or not, but I think that there's a, given that that's the vast majority of our students, as well as, I, I believe, probably Rosette, who take, they take 127. You know, that, that, that I know that they, these students deal with it. And I don't know how, what the experience is with your class, whether you've asked what math they've taken, whether they've taken the social science calculus or the, the, the calculus for math majors and, and hard scientists, and how, and how those, if you notice the difference in how they fare in the course. I think that that's actually been a problem uh, because I think they come in, as you said, taking just one course in calculus and they, some of them see the idea of partial derivatives for the first time uh, when they enter the class and, and this just came unsolicited from them. They walked in and they said once that they would like to change the prerequisites for Econ 203. They were suggesting that they should, there should be two calculus courses that are required before Econ 203 so that and they have to do it if they have to get an econ major anyway. So they were suggesting a reordering of um, of the program. But I mean, I understand that there's feasibility concerns and there's scheduling concerns. And but in general, I've noticed, and this goes back to the question that Carmen was asking. It's that I've noticed that as long as we're talking about interesting things, they pick up the skills along the way. So I realized that by the end of the semester, they're able to do math, the, the math pretty easily, but almost as a byproduct. That wasn't the intention. The intention was not to teach them the math, but they end up doing it because the focus is on actually answering questions and the focus is on asking interesting questions and then like getting tools to be able to answer them. So the, the process is working almost backwards than um, learning the math and then answering questions. So I think we've been able to deal with it, but maybe we could consider reordering so that the, they do about a couple of courses of calc before um, doing the control three. I just wanted to mention with regard to critical thinking, Martha Stas, who's an office, does a, is involved in a national and regional critical thinking assessment that I volunteered my class to participate in this semester. It requires um, a page writing assignment um, and very little work on the part of the instructor except to fill out a cover sheet describing the goals and and what, basically what critical thinking skills you would like your students to have achieved and demonstrate in this assignment. And then you get feedback on it. And you don't have to participate if you don't want to in the committees that are reading. They collect thousands of papers from throughout the, the, the campus. They, uh, this is the second year. So they have some data from last year. Um, I think they had over 50,000 papers. So if you're interested in critical thinking outcomes, you might participate. In that, but as I said, they require, I, I actually have to raise the, I have five to seven pages now, it's eight to ten pages that the students write in my class. The other is that my class, this is the, this fall was the first semester where students in my class that has micro as a prerequisite volunteered that some of them took size class. And I uh, don't have a, a complete record of who took what and how they did, but the students who talked to me about it did have some, need some special attention and some foundations like Martin and Marshall analysis, for example. But they were very successful students overall uh, compared to the like, median student completed the class in the So we, we might have, if, if this continues to be taught, we might have some people who use your course as a prerequisite to uh, get some data on how we're using that uh, in subsequent courses. Lisa, could you email me the name of that person, Martha? Sasson. 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 Sasson.
Just another comment on the math thing. So the, the other thing that I found I've really had to think about pretty carefully while going about teaching this is, like, what is the point of the math? Um, and I say this because I, when, when I took intermediate microeconomics as an undergraduate, um, and we had to do like Lagrange, uh, Lag uh, like just Lagrangians, and go about doing that constraint maximization problem. Like you'd have something like a 30 point question where you had A, B, C, D, and E, and E would be, depend on D, and D would depend on C, and C would depend on B, and B would depend on A. And if you got A wrong, you'd lose all 30 points, um, basically. Uh, may, maybe you would have been fortunate enough to accrue like one or two um, partial credit points, but they were pretty mercenary about how they graded that kind of thing. M maybe that's just true in kind of a British style system like we have in South Africa, but that, that was what would happen. But then, while teaching this, I've had to think pretty carefully about like, what I actually want is, it's useful, it's a student, I want the student to convey, like, what do I mean by a marginal rate of substitution? Like, what does that actually mean? Um, why does it make sense that we want to think about that in terms of an indifference curve? And the indifference curve can take a whole variety of different um, shapes. And so what my general uh, discussion that we've been having while teaching this and that I've been sharing with other people who are, who are test teaching the course, like we have someone in India teaching it, been taught in Ireland, being taught in South Africa, um, a prospective person in China teaching it, someone, perhaps someone else in Japan. So there are people here with various different backgrounds thinking about how to teach this and one of the things that I've been saying to them is like, look, one of the things that you can often do is actually show them the mathematical answer um, to something. So one of the things that I've been doing is saying, show that this is the answer and then interpret it. Um, because what I'm doing there is I'm trying to say, look, yeah, you're going to get some points for doing the math, for sure. And like, I want to get why, you think the math, why we think the math is important. But I also want you to show like, why this thing actually makes sense in terms of economic insights. Now, this is again going, like I was part of this group on discussing pedagogy at Smith and the learning sciences and being taught about how to think about this kind of, um, these kinds of ideas um, more clearly. And so that has helped inform our conversation about what we put in it and what we encourage people to assess. Um, but I think that's part of a wider conversation, not only about our course, but like how we assess <coughs> mathematical and um, mathematical literacy and numeracy in economics courses, um, rather than just what's going on in our book. Because I think the problem that we often face is that students have an absent counterfactual. They take our course, but that means necessarily that they're not taking someone else's course. So like if this intermediate microeconomics course is so hard, but they don't have any other intermediate microeconomics experience to compare it to. Um, because intermediate microeconomics generally is hard. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, go Can ahead. Something this sure, go ahead. Month. It's the first semester I teach this course. I'm not observing a very strong correlation between the initial math skills and how they are doing in the course. So I'm not observing this thing that you mentioned that oh, oh, happens often, that people that are very strong in math even if they skip the intuition, they recognize the optimization problem, they can solve it. I'm not observing this, because I, I think what the correlation I'm observing, I think people that are doing well in this course are the ones that have the patience and the motivation to look for 10 minutes at a graph, like the ones that Simon showed, and say, okay, this element means this, and it has this shape because of this reason, and spend some time looking at, at the graph until they understand all the elements and make sense of them, these are the people that are doing well. And if a person like this is weak in math, I observe that they find a way to understand how to take a partial derivative of a linear function. Uh, so I have people that are very strong in math, but they are not doing that well, because, even if, because they would like to start immediately like solving the optimization problem. They don't have the patience to spend time with the problem, looking at the graph and so on. And so this course, I think, the book is done in such a way that you probably favors more uh, the people that spend time with the problems than those that have the mathematical, mathematical skills and go with it. So I agree with so I also observe that uh, it's possible for people to overcome the math problem if they have the motivation. So I uh, bring the behavioral uh, comments from Israel's economics back, uh, back in. Um, so one of the functions of intermediate micro and this introductory micro is to um, have create sort of some knee-jerk policy reaction you know, against the minimum wage, 
um, against taxi medallions, against um, in favor of uh, free trade, um, against rent control. Um, and so, um, so, so even if you know the world doesn't conform to that micro, you know, uh, intermediate micro typically has. And I think one of the reasons that behavioral economics has caused some mainstreamers to kind of fly off the handle, you get kind of outraged responses sometimes to experimental behavioral economics, that it kind of undermines the benchmarks that intermediate micro taught as the optimization first two thirds of the book tend to generate. So I'm kind of interested to hear you um, sort of reflect on that, and then also to, to the authors of the book and, and the implementers, to what extent does sort of the perfect competition, to what extent does it sort of haunt as a benchmark, and to what extent has it been thrown out altogether? Because you know, if you think, oh, that market is kind of competitive enough, and sure that company has a little bit of, a little monopolistic power, but it's a modest deviation from the perfect competition out from a very sort of Chicago perspective. I think they may talk about them pharmaceuticals and stuff. Um, you know, that, um, that that gives you a pretty different angle than I think the one that's coming out of your book, uh, or out of behavioral, which is, you know, pretty much like, oh, it's rather different world. So can you talk about, can you reflect on sort of the role of benchmarks and perfect competition? Um, yeah, so, um, <coughs> I'm not going to speak for you. I'll speak for me and you can speak for you. Okay. Um, I, uh, it has, it has been my perspective kind of from, from, you know, starting into the world of behavioral economics my second year of grad school and, and continuing that um, perfect competition and the benchmarks are very useful in that, in that they apply in a lot of settings and they're very simple models that give you elegant predictions and it gives you something to compare against. Um, and, and so they're, they're powerful models and, and uh, I at least am of the perspective that they are not something that we should throw out because they are unique to us um, and, and, uh, and are an important perspective. Um, that said, uh, even with those benchmarks and with the, the types of policy uh, implications that you mentioned, there are different ways that you can think about those, right? So uh, one way to think about those is, oh, there's a loss in surplus and therefore it's bad, right? Another way to think of it is, oh, there are winners and losers, and how we evaluate that depends on what we value as a society. And so those are different discussions based on the exact same policies coming out of the, the standard benchmark. And so that's, that's one thing, is that there's, there's different ways that you can think about teaching it. You know, so, so one of the, the standard um, ways that people teach things like the prisoner's dilemma is, uh, the equilibrium is that you should defect and thus you should defect. Another way to teach it is we're not at the social optimum and that's a problem, how can you try to solve it? And so even taking the same games and the same issues, there's different ways that you can shape that discussion to focus on um, different, different aspects of the problem. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think I, for me, the behavioral and just tempers the, the kind of standard results. And so perhaps when you look at experimental evidence about monopoly, we don't see as much monopoly as, as theory might predict. And there, there are a, lot, a wide range of these things where the experimental behavior results suggest that these things aren't quite as serious of problems as, as what the standard theory predicts, right? I'm thinking about noncompliance in a lot of different areas, right? We don't see people cheating on their taxes near as much as theory would predict. Um, yeah, and yeah, so that's how I work that in. And I think this, that actually fits really nicely with their tax today. Yeah, thank you. I, I have some, something that happened in my course I think is related to what you said about having, I mean, what is the the thing that we don't see the benchmark and what we don't see the special case. So I had uh, an exam question that was about uh, evaluating the statement that uh, it was something like as a self-interest person is rational, but the sense was uh, does rationality imply self-interest? So I assume that student, student would answer by taking self-interest as the benchmark 
and then saying, but also other kinds of behavior can be rational because that's what we teach in the course. And a student answered like this. He said, well, he started in the good way, right way, as I imagine the, answer, the right answer to be. So he said, rationality does not impose the content of, the, of your preferences. It's about being consistent with your preferences. And then he said, for how strange it might seem to us, even a self-interested, totally self-interested person can be rational. <laughs> Which was totally not what I was asking, because I assumed that they would have considered self-interest the normal case, and that they had to demonstrate that you can have something else. But after, but because they didn't have the standard course, but this course, they didn't take self-interest as the benchmark. But they would, so you, I think this shows that there is really some effect in changes what we consider the benchmark and the special case, changing the perspective on this as an effect. I know we're out of time. I, I want to come back to what you said, Angela, because I think it was, it's exactly right. Uh, the story we tell about the perfectly competitive model and actually what we represent it as uh, is, uh, it, is uh, it, it's a very rich problem. I mean, you know, okay, we've, we've got some people exchanging things. Well, if they're exchanging voluntarily, there must be gains from trade. So that's a big point. And then you want to think about, well, at the end of the day, are all the potential gains from trade uh, exploited? That's a good question to ask. But that immediately, because there are gains from trade, there is some positive rents to be distributed, then immediately they have to ask, well, who gets them? Yeah. And so they immediately come to two questions, which is, uh, okay, there are gains from trade, that's obvious. Are, uh, under what conditions will they be fully exploited? And under what conditions will they be distributed in a way which somebody ethically would think was fair? So the model can do a whole lot of work. I mean, and it's nothing conservative about it, particularly because there's so many ways in which you, the, the outcome is either going to be unfair or it's going to be that you don't get there. Um, and, but I think it's important that when we talk about the perfectly competitive model, that, and I'm sorry Donald's not here, because I, uh, that we don't talk about it in the Valrasian sense of a price-taking equilibrium, that's a shortcut. And I mean, I'm really very high on Hayek, as you may have noticed. Uh, that is essentially bargaining to the Pareto uh, frontier is what we typically do. Now, there's some special cases in which you can do it through you know, an auction-like uh, thing. But uh, once you get the perfectly competitive model uh, stated in terms of people who are actually not, uh, I mean, uh, I mean I, I, we should stop using the word perfect competition or, uh, we, and we should use the word perfect competitors. A perfect competitor is somebody who exploits all possible mutual gains from trade. For example, perfect price discrimination means that even if you're facing a downward sloping demand curve, you will still price the, the marginal good at the marginal cost. Um, so, you know, just thinking about all the ways that a perfect competitor would exploit the possible gains, and of course you're going to get to the frontier then. But of course it may be that all the gains are made by one side. Uh, I mean, you could you could go on for weeks just teaching the basic thing without, you know doing anything more than that, and they'd come out with a pretty sophisticated view, and it wouldn't be right or left or anything, it would just be understanding that process. And just, just to add to what Sam said, the, the other point here is that, that we teach uh, perfect competition or perfect competitors um, as a consequence of a strategic interaction, in the sense that price taking is in fact a best response. It's not that um, we're assuming that price taking is the thing that gives us a, a, that function, but rather that there are strategic reasons that underpin that, that result rather than treat it as an assumption, um, which comes out of this yeah. kind of Hayekian and Kono style thinking. Um, yeah. I think we're going to give you the last word there. We've gone a little bit over. Let's thank please all of our.